Fez Technology has been innovating at a breakneck pace. Few companies have been at the innovative edge uh, the way that Varsilla has. Uh, you, I mean, you guys, um, with the companies that you have integrated into the business and the product development cycle that you're going through, have a lot to be uh, proud of, frankly. I think that what's interesting today, and we'll talk about some of the evolution of how batteries are being integrated into solar projects in particular, is the nature of what developers are asking for, whether that's being driven by uh, customer requirements or, uh, or nodal requirements. It, it, everyone wants a bigger battery. So, Dave, I'd like to jump right in with, uh, you know, not all markets are headed in the same direction. So if everybody's wanting a bigger battery, what are the issues that are currently driving the product and project design for that? Yeah, we have a lot of customers internationally as well as the U.S. Um, I think there's an industry trend towards just bigger and bigger DC blocks. Part of that's driven by the need to have more capacity in a smaller footprint in space. Uh, but it's starting to sort of reach its practical limits, right? So we have customers that are coming to us and they're saying, we, we want the bigger block, but we also want to be able to deliver into Hawaii, like not a mainstream island or Taiwan or other markets where it's a challenge to be able to put something that's getting now up to 40 tons and 50 tons in size. Um, so our approach has really been to come to market with more variety. Like the original Quantum is 1.6 megawatt hours, yeah. I think so. Um, the next generation was four. Next generation after that's going to be five. We might get as high as 6.5 or seven, but that's where I think you start to sort of cap out and you end up doing field labor instead of having it factory qualified on the front end. Uh, that's, where, that's where I think um, the, the model starts to break down. You end up going backwards, right? That's what we used to do five years ago. We used to put the modules in, in the field, and mm -hmm. that was a bad idea then. It's going to be a bad idea in 2025. What are some of the ways that, uh, that you see developers asking for these kinds of product augmentations, mm -hmm. and how do you handle that in the product development cycle? Yeah, so there are a number of ways that we, uh, we can see augmentation happening for these various products. Uh, the biggest, uh, the key way that augmentation happens in the field is what we call deep sea shuffling. So you essentially move DC products away to free up an existing inverter and you slot new modules behind that freed up inverter. Uh, the difficulty there, or, or the reason why you need to do that is because oftentimes you have interconnect agreements and restrictions that prevent you from adding more AC capacity. And so you need to work with your existing DC capacity and your existing AC capacity to shuffle modules around uh, and slot in that new capacity. The biggest issue with that, as Dave just mentioned, moving modules in the field is incredibly difficult. It's something that we have strived to get away from in this industry because we know that that comes with significant challenges. Uh, and so as we get to these larger enclosure sizes where it is difficult to free up an inverter mm -hmm. uh, and, and shuffle those modules into existing areas on your site, uh, you, you then have to divert to alternative augmentation strategies that might open yourself up to handling modules in the field. Dave, talk to me a bit about uh, auxiliary power. I didn't know much about it until you brought it up in a conversation that we had. How, is, how are things like auxiliary power driving some of the issues that you see with uh, integration in the field? Yeah, there are a couple different issues you run into with aux power, right? One, uh, most of the PPAs or tolling agreements that customers have have their sort of net power output, right? So as you, you start to sort of build up the system sizes, you build up the thermal mass that's inside a box, you potentially get to a mismatch between the size of the chiller and the size of the, the batteries and the ability to manage all those. So you have sort of an inefficiency in aux power that can, that can lead to millions of dollars yeah. right, in project costs over, over the long term. So our customers are constantly looking for ways to be able to reduce aux power. Um, they're also looking for ways to be able to avoid hooking up aux power early on in the project stage. Right? So we've been doing a lot of work with technology to see how we can let our products sit for longer and longer periods of time mm. in the field without hooking up that aux early. It's, it's an expensive proposition. If you don't have your grid interconnection, you can spend $10 million on gen sets just to keep your batteries cool. 
just to not have additional degradation inside the battery. So when we we're looking for uh, cell suppliers that we're working with, we're working with, with the ones that have more stable technology so we can avoid that component. One of the other issues that we see being raised a lot uh, as we get closer and closer to population centers is this concept of noise and noise mm -hmm. attenuation. Far afield from uh, our sort of common understanding of noise at, on wind sites, for example, uh, the noise on storage sites is this constant, permanent uh, resonance, right? And the larger the project, the larger the battery, the, the, lar the more sort of uh, storage requirement on site, the more we have to think about combating these issues. How is Vartzilla looking at the, this concept of noise attenuation? Where do you see that there are perhaps um, misalignments in expectations in the field from developers versus what is possible with the, with the units? Yeah, so noise attenuation can be done in a, a number of ways. Two of the key ways we do that is by increasing the surface area of your chiller so that you have a heat exchange across multiple fins and you reduce the need for fans, which are the driver of noise in chillers. Uh, and the other way is for shields that can attenuate the noise kind of externally to the chiller. Uh, and the, for the first method, where you are reducing the surface area, that really requires a lot of space. Uh, I'm sorry, you're increasing the surface area, which requires a lot of space in your enclosure. And so as Dave mentioned at the start here, we are striving for these compact, easy to transport, easy to receive units, but that really constrains the amount of space you have. And when you couple that with increased capacity in your system, you are now fighting for the space of battery modules and for your chiller to be large enough to have efficient heat exchange and uh, reduce the noise that your system is outputting. Uh, and then for the second method of noise attenuation, which shields externally, it's really critical in your design to consider how that might impact then heat exchange back into the chiller uh, and uh, there in therefore increase your thermal load, which potentially increases the ox consumption that you have. And so as you're considering noise and the ways that you're t um, combating the increased noise that you get with a larger capacity that you're supporting, you have to consider these other factors like capacity, like ox power that might conflict with your noise strategies. Yeah, uh, to add to that, I mean, that's, that's where we put a lot of our focus, right? We'll constantly get questions and say, well, why is it five megawatt hours and not 5.4? Well, it's five megawatt hours, not 5.4, because you need space for an efficient chiller to be able to get the right. noise down. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to be able to have sort of ambient cooling and space between the racks to be able to get the thermal sort of, um, you know, it to be able to sit for long periods of time without additional ox power. So we're always looking for ways that we're optimizing the design, taking into account not just our own cost, right? Today's industry trend, if you're a battery manufacturer, is how many megawatt hours can I stuff into a cube right. and ship out into the field? What you're doing is you're taking all your cost and you're throwing that cost onto other people to deal with the problem at the EPC level or at the other system levels. We look at it and we say, we want an optimized solution on day one that goes out to the field so that everybody sort of gets the, the, the benefit of these over some period of time. Yeah. The, the decisions on new product introduction and product <clears throat> expansion uh, are something that fascinate me. You guys recently introduced a Quantum 3. It's a new product. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really uh, want to better understand is the reasoning behind the well, one, the reasoning of the launch, like talk a bit about what Quantum 3 is for those who are unfamiliar and why are you maintaining both an AC and a DC block in the portfolio? Yeah. So Quantum 3 is an AC block system. It is a 20 foot high cube enclosure uh, with five megawatt hours and with integrated string inverters. Uh, and so what that means is that you've eliminated the need for the external string, essential inverter, and uh, you've internalized those inverters and uh, enabled rack level control of your system. And the reason we've introduced this product is uh, largely tied to a lot of the trade-offs we've already discussed today, which is that there are multiple uh, objectives of these systems and one product doesn't necessarily fit the needs of every site. Uh, and so we've really focused on diversifying our product portfolio to support those independent needs of each project site and uh, objective. And so we have the Quantum 3, which is our AC block, but that stands together with our Quantum 2 and our Quantum High Energy, which are our DC block products and uh, we, we see different applications for each of them. So uh, for a DC block, you might uh, be more preferential to that. If you're looking for more flexibility, you can size your system uh, and select your central inverter that best fits your sizing needs. You allow for DC connection for solar resources. 
uh, you can more easily augment, as we talked about earlier, with a DC system. And then an AC system gives you that availability increase that comes with a string inverter, which is much easier to maintain, much easier to replace. And if it does fail, you have only shut down a single rack versus your entire system. It comes with uh, increased delivery times, better delivery times, because you're shipping fewer total units. Uh, and it comes with that rack level control that allows you to maximize the performance of your system. So very different needs for both products, and that's why we've maintained both in our portfolio. Dave, you mentioned <clears throat> as a global company, you have to think about the product considerations, not just here domestically, but abroad. Let's focus here on the US. Uh, so what about the US market changes how you think about the design of your battery storage products? Yeah, a lot of it's driven simply by the fact that policy mandates certain manufacturing practices, mm -hmm. right? So today we have the IRA um, that says you can get a 10% adder if you manufacture inside the U.S. for your batteries. Um, you also have uh, the, the opposite side. You have the 301 tariffs that basically say if you're exporting from China, we're going we're gonna to charge you a certain percentage greater from there. Mm -hmm. um, the, all those considerations make it very complicated, Right. We need to be able to figure out how we deliver a U.S.-made BMS. Um, need to be able to figure out how to keep the cybersecurity, meet all the domestic content requirements, but also keep a, uh, a global supply chain. Mm -hmm. right? The more and more these get narrowed into corners, uh, the harder it is to keep price down, harder it is to meet expectation. Um, we're also very thorough on the fire safety side. So... Um, a lot of people don't really consider the roll-up for a product, but if you bring a product to market in a market like the U.S., and you want to have all the 9548 testing, and you want to do bespoke fire testing, like these add months and months, quarters, even sure. years to the timeline, and, and they're, they're expensive, right? Taking five megawatt hours of batteries and burning them to the ground is not a cheap exercise, but... It's necessary to really understand how it, oper how it burns right, and how you're going to deal with it as a first responder. And we incorporate that into the fire safety standards that we have because that's bar none the most important thing we ever do. Yeah, I imagine as well, given that you have such a uh, large global supply chain, it ties back a bit to maintaining that DC block integration as well. Yeah, in part, right? Because we have to be able to serve multiple markets that have multiple product demands. Yeah. And then customers have preferences. I can, mm. you know, go out into the, into the halls, meet up with people I've met in the past who are absolutely SMA zealots. Right. I'm only going to use SMA. Well, I want to help that customer as much as I want to help somebody that wants an AC block and do it more simplified in the fashion that we're bringing to market today. Makes sense. Now, from a product development perspective, you have to think a lot about things like cybersecurity and the BMS product development timeline can be extensive, as Dave pointed out. How do you think about that within the, within the the construct of where your team is putting their effort and prioritizing their time. Yeah, absolutely. I think what Dave pointed out, which is that there are a variety of demands from our global customers, especially when it comes to something like cybersecurity, which really uh, is specific to each independent country. So we're seeing the demand for US designed uh, and engineered BMS systems, but we are seeing similar kind of demands globally. And to develop a BMS system, for example, that is catered to specific regions within the world is costly and timely and uh, takes away from other product development initiatives that might be more uh, innovative or, or further kind of our development and design. And so it's really important to weigh where that is necessary and where we can take alternative approaches uh, to satisfy the needs and really, I mean, uh, cater to what are understandable and real concerns around things like cybersecurity. Yep. It feels like there's a typical innovation cycle, Dave, we talked about this offline, um, that you have this slow diversification uh, rather than unification of product offerings, mm -hmm. right? As the industry gets uh, more and more complex, we have to split our time, our effort, our, in our investments into region-specific products, into vertical-specific products. Uh, is it inevitable that all OEMs have to support this essentially market-specific product portfolio? Or is this all just basic chemistry? Are we going to be able to revert back to this best design scenario that can fit for electrons to move into and out of storage and onto the grid? Yeah, I think we probably have a few more years of ballooning out, 
Like you have mm. different geographies like Australia that want Australian lithium. Um, the IRA and its rules aren't going away mm. anytime soon. Europe has similar rules that are coming into play. But eventually, I think it converges back again, right? Uh, when you when you take away sort of preferential treatment, right? You're not treating energy storage as um, an economic bolster for jobs. You're treating energy storage as energy storage for the purpose of that it was intended for. Then I think it starts to reconverge. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a quote that you used in a, in a prior call because uh, <laughs> I've, I've got it written down and you have to bring it from memory. Left to technology, technology reconverges. Left to politicians, chaos ensues. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder, uh, Neha, as we wrap up, uh, any, any f- parting thoughts on where you see this uh, as we continue to further uh, diverge, you're responsible for that product development. How is your team prioritizing the specific requirements that you get from your key clients in the field, even the SMA zealots? Yeah, uh, we really spend time up front uh, identifying what requirements are negotiable and what are mm-hmm. absolutely table stakes need to have in our product. And fire safety, for example, non-negotiable. Yeah. Uh, but things like noise and ox power consumption, uh, capacity, things that we've already discussed today are items that we regularly revisit and understand where those requirements kind of become nice to haves, not need to haves, and where we can uh, prioritize things that are more important for customers. And that's where that diverse product portfolio, again, becomes important. We can identify what product is really the key target for some of these objectives and where that is not as necessary for our project site. So it's a really uh, constant process of negotiating within our engineering team to understand what we can achieve realistically and what our market actually needs. Dave, unprepared question, but final, final word. What do customers really want? <laughs> customers, it's interesting. I'll, I'll put it as customers want what they want. Right? Mm-hmm. In my entire career, you have the luxury of selling two things, and only two things at any company you ever work for. You can sell what you have, or you can sell what they want. <laughs> right? Today, we're in a marketplace where it's want. Right? They have very specific needs. They've architected their projects in certain ways. They've got grid code interconnections that they have to deal with. There's so many external elements. We have to be a nimble company and deliver what they're looking for, which is why we want our product suite to diversify at this point. I love that. Great answer. Dave Hebert is the Director of Commercial Sales and Management at Wartzilla Energy Storage and Optimization. His colleague Neha Sinha is the Product Manager for ESS. You've been listening to our conversation on how battery storage is innovating and differentiating itself in different markets. Thank you for joining us here live at the Power Up Live stage brought to you by Wartzilla Energy Storage and Optimization. Thank you for joining us for this lively conversation. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of fun.